Hello, ciao. Thank you to everyone at Torino Graphic Days, the organizers, the staff, the volunteers. It's been a wonderful few days and we're very happy and excited to be here. So my name is Patricia. This is my partner, Greg. We are graphic designers and educators from New York City. We are also the founders of Display Graphic Design Collection. Uh, this is display.org. Display is our personal collection of over 2,000 items, which we've been collecting for over 10 years. And these include books, periodicals, ephemera, and some posters. We use the website, thisisdisplay.org, to share some of our collection to people who maybe don't live in New York City, and also because all of our collection is in a very tiny New York City apartment, so we really can't have too many visitors, but we try to share as much as we can through our website and Instagram and Twitter. Um, so we collect mid-century modern graphic design with a focus on the United States, Switzerland, and Italy, and also some beyond those countries. And the years we're talking about are circa 1920s through the 60s. We've been fortunate enough to curate some exhibitions, such as this one on Ladislav Sutnar, a modern design pioneer. We've also loaned parts of our collection to other museums for exhibitions. We research, write about design history, and we use the materials in our collection to teach ourselves and also our students in the classroom. And you can actually see approximately 50 items from our Italian graphic design collection at the exhibition outside, uh, which we curated about mid-century graphic design from Milan. And the exhibit is related to some of the things you'll see in this presentation. Most recently, we used our American graphic design collection to design and produce this book, which is written by Stephen Heller and my partner here, Greg. Thank you. Buongiorno. Buonasera. <laughs> okay. um, yes, uh, my book, um, recently published in the last uh, 30 days, is called The Moderns, Mid-Century American Graphic Design. And the book features the work of over 60 uh, American graphic designers, 18 of them emigres, and 45 of them homegrown, so 18 people who emigrated from mostly Europe to the United States and the 45 homegrowns who were born uh, in America and who practiced this modernist graphic design sensibility only in the USA between the years 1937 and approximately 1970. <clears throat> So the book tells uh, the visual story of American modernism during what me and my co-author, uh, Stephen Heller, believe is a very exciting and prosperous uh, period in graphic design, but also um, in the United States. And I want to point out, it's not a book about monolithic modernism. It's uh, a, a book that instead features a, a, a variety of viewpoints and sensibilities, but all uh, practicing with the same ideology. So there's a lot of things that tie the work together, but if you look at the work, it doesn't always look and feel the same, especially since that the work starts from the late 30s uh, and moves up to the 1970s. I like to think of the book as a um, melting pot like America, of modern graphic design. So that's my book. I'm not talking uh, about my book today. Today, um, what I'd like to talk about is the research um, that I learned while writing my book, which took about two years. I'd like to specifically talk about uh, Italian-born graphic designers and their published work in the United States. So these are uh, Italian graphic designers who emigrated to the United States. Some of that is included in the book, but also Italian graphic designers who were publishing work in the United States but continued to live um, in Italy. And there are a few um, what I call adopted Italian 
graphic designers. So not uh, uh, of Italian origin, but made their way through Italy and had uh, a large impact on the work that they did in Italy. So some of these names um, maybe you'll know and hopefully some will be new to you. I'll be mentioning a lot of names. Bear with me. It's a historical talk. The talk is not about my work, but the work of these uh, important people. I think by seeing the work, what I found is that the work is incredibly influential from an American point of view, because the work influenced many American graphic designers and also the graphic industry in the United States. And thirdly, maybe most importantly, the work directly influences American culture and society. Absolutely. So, okay. Just um, a little context. This is not the kind of work that we'll be looking at, but this is, uh, generally speaking, in the 1920s and 1930s, America was generally conservative country, and most of the commercial design that was being produced was um, more of, of a traditional nature. Things were uh, um, more uh, representational in art, more illustration, uh, lots of copy in the ads, like to the right. Nothing, uh, nothing too modern and nothing abstract. That's happening in Europe. That's happening in Italy. But that doesn't really make its way into the United States until a little bit later. Mostly because some of the first uh, modern designers were coming from Europe, particularly uh, Italy. So, A good place to start is with uh, this gentleman, who everybody probably uh, heard of, hopefully. Uh, this is the Italian futurist, artist, and designer Fortunato De Pero, who left Genoa, Italy, uh, for New York City in 1928. Uh, De Pero brought with him to the United States, remember, a very conservative United States. He brought with him a new uh, enthusiasm, radical ideas, modern approaches to commercial design, both exciting and at times frustrating, because not everything that he did was receptive in the United States. Here, um, in the wonderful picture, he's featured with his uh, lovely wife, Rosetta, holding the uh, important bolted book, the important uh, first artist book, futurist book, uh, in New York City on the rooftop of the Art Directors Club, or Advertising Club, I'm sorry, but it's in New York. So here is uh, DePero's business card from 1929, where he announces his um, first workshop slash studio. And he designed this with diagonal and twisted um, abstract buildings with expressive hand lettering. This would have been uh, a very new idea for the United States in 1929. So something that DePero brought to the States, particularly uh, New York City on 23rd Street is where this was. Uh, he, he experienced a, a certain uh, amount of success in the US. He did uh, many commercial publications, magazines, some of which we'll look at briefly. He designed costumes for stage productions, and he even designed, um, did some interior design. Uh, the story goes that Rosetta, his wife, even offered free ravioli, homemade ravioli, and uh, for potential clients to, to get to work. While DePero was uh, apparently in the back room um, fermenting the grapes and serving illegal, because it was during uh, a period of prohibition, uh, wine. So. Maybe they attracted, uh, hopefully, clients that way. <laughs> Let's see. So uh, DePero brought progressive ideas to his many um, striking and stylistic covers. As we see here, these are from 1929 to 1931 for uh, avant-garde cinema magazine on the left fashion magazine in the middle, and uh, more of a lifestyle magazine on the right. Festive, loud color palettes, some with hand letters, and um, 
many geometric shapes with a futuristic spirit. The middle, um, the middle one is actually a proposed cover for Vogue that apparently was rejected by the editors and uh, possibly because it was too forward thinking or too different at the time. So that one actually didn't get published. The one on the left and right did. So DePero left New York City, returned to Italy in 1930, and although he did experience some, some frustration and uh, an overwhelming number of refusals, I'm told, much of his work wasn't accepted, uh, it was this early work that starts to um, help bring a new visual language to America. So it's, we start here with uh, the work of DePero. Moving uh, right along, um, the next uh, designer, this is not entirely chronological, but, but some of it is. These are the earliest designers. We'll get to the 1960s later. Um, born in Naples, uh, Paolo Garetto. Uh, worked in Italy, worked in Paris, and even lived and worked for a short period here in Torino as an art director before leaving for New York City in 1931 later returning to Paris. But uh, during the time in New York City, he established contact with Condé Nast and the Vanity Fair magazine publication, which was a, uh, a widely read and uh, important publication in America. From 1931 to 1935, he designed approximately 50 covers. And each cover reflected uh, the current events of the time, things that were happening in America that he needed to um, communicate either, you know, symbolically or abstractly. He said of this period, it was the most exciting time of my life. Innovative and illustrative designs combined with conceptual thinking and uh, his style of caricatures which is probably what he's mostly known for in Italy and Paris, that work early on. Vibrant colors, and mostly we see um, him using the airbrush. It was this distinctive style that created a new expression in America in the 1930s. But Goretto also designed new and unique points of view for the leading business magazine in America at the time, uh, Fortune, which you may have heard of. And these are both from 1932. Uh, this, this graphic approach was slightly at odds with the work we just looked at. Uh, um, the caricature work, the airbrush work. This was using modern abstraction and simplified forms and shapes to communicate uh, the message of the time, the industrial and commercial strength of the United States is what he was going for. <laughs> Moving along, here's a name that nobody really talks about, at least in the United States, but uh, um, Costantino Nivola was mostly known as a sculptor and a muralist or a painter. But the reason he's important in the United States is because he uh, worked in Milan at the Olivetti uh, factor, uh, the Olivetti design department, before leaving fascist Italy um, in about 1939. When he comes to New York, he actually lands a very important job as the art director for a very important magazine of the time, Interiors. So uh, we have uh, an Italian moving to the United States and uh, Sorry, you can hear me? <laughs> okay. Uh, we have an Italian um, moving to the United States and taking the very important position of an art director for this magazine and also an architecture magazine called Pencil Points and a f another magazine called Progressive Architecture. So he was the lead guy in charge and these magazines were important and influential because they were communicating directly to industrial designers, commercial artists, um, architects, and interior designers. So his influence, at least 
um, within the trade was widely, uh, <clears throat> widely felt. He designed these two virtually unknown ads, uh, at least in the United States, where he's experimenting with texture, dimensionality, and collage for a product of marbled, hand-painted papers. And these ads are tucked away in some of the early uh, issues of those magazines that I just mentioned. I can't give you the whole story about all the people. There's just too many influential Italians <laughs> working uh, in Italy. So these are brief little snippets. Um, we can talk after for a long time <laughs> about all of them. OK, so here is our first adopted Italian designer. Adopted, adopted. Uh, Leo Leone was born in the Netherlands, but moved to Italy at a very young age and spent his uh, formative years in Italy where he, um, where he got his training, went to school, and also worked before moving to the United States in 1939. There are a few people like this in history when we look back. These are people who, who became influential in Italy, learned the trade, became skilled here, and then took some of those ideas and that talent to America and created something uh, half American and half Italian. So uh, um, Leone arrived in Philadelphia first and then later moved to New York City where he worked as an art director for uh, multiple ad agencies and also many um, uh, magazines. magazines. He designed uh, this modern and patriotic poster using photo montage for uh, a very impressive client at the time, 1941, the US government. I love this quote by Leone. I had brought a breath of imagination from Italy, which perhaps was rare in America, but they were incredibly professional. I felt 100% Italian and 100% American. This is important. He doesn't feel Dutch, even though he's born in the Netherlands. And he feels, presumably, that he's learned the creativity and the imagination and the way to think. And he brought those uh, ideas and influences to the United States, where he paired them with a more practical field like advertising. Leone moved to New York City in 1948, and he became the art director of the uh, well-known, we've seen, Fortune magazine for more than 11 years. This cover uh, is a special issue for New York, and the editors uh, in the magazine say, it's one of New York City's greatest spectacles, thousands of lit office windows shining through the early darkness of a winter afternoon. I say logical and playful. I say American and Italian, and this is the two influences that I'm trying to say. Beyond uh, Fortune Magazine, Leone was a uh, consultant for a company I'm sure everybody knows, uh, Olivetti. He was the consultant art director. He designed advertisements. He designed product brochures such as these two. And he also designed the first Olivetti showroom on, uh, in New, York, uh, New York's famous Fifth Avenue. That was in the 1950s. He was also included in New York City's uh, Museum of Modern Art exhibition. In 1954, the exhibition was called Four American Graphic Designers, directed by Mildred Constantine, uh, the director uh, of the Arts and Architecture Department and included the work of Leone and other pioneers. Maybe this is the most important thing he did for this particular topic. Um, it was his short tenure as an, uh, a co-editor co and also the art director of Print Magazine, at the time America's leading graphic design magazine. 
Um, this special issue, produced in 1954, is all about Italian design. It talks about the uh, earliest Italian pioneers, art directors, publishers, magazines, architecture, talks about Olivetti, but at the very end is a very important four or five pages called um, Italia Grafica. And it's the first time that, uh, that the work from Studio Bogeri and about six or seven others, Roberto Carboni, Albe Steiner, Max Huber, Franco Grignani, Bruno Minari, first time collectively all this work was published in an American magazine. So, American readers, American trade, the graphic designers, the typographers were actually seeing this, uh, seeing this work, um, at least collectively, for the first time. George uh, Giusti, one of my favorite, uh, worked in Milan and then Switzerland before arriving in the United States in 1938. He designed work uh, for book jacket designs, magazine covers, records, advertisements. His work basically dominated the U.S. commercial space from 1940s through the mid-1960s. He brought a classical skill. He was a serious painter, and he combined that with uh, conceptual thinking. Um, and as we'll see, his work, you, it's, it's hard to pinpoint. His styles change based on his client, based on the objectives at hand. Uh, here he is in the Bronx, New York, in his um, apartment studio, 1943. <clears throat> his earliest work from 1942 and 1944 involved detailed airbrush illustrations showing real objects as technical drawings. He's experimenting with cropping, with scale, with dimensionality, with tonality, with abstraction. These are new things for Americans. He's from Italy. He has uh, a work experience in both Italy and Switzerland, but he's bringing these ideas to a commercial capacity that many people, at least with the Fortune magazine, because it was widely read, this is a, a smaller trade journal, many people would have seen this work, many important people, other designers. This one reveals his uh, interest in physics and surrealism. But his later work, 1952 and 1962, was more informal on the left and more reductive on the right. The one on the left is more painterly, more organic, looser, freer, the one on the right is more uh, of an abstraction. The one on the right is an advertisement targeted to graphic designers who made record album jackets, the covers for records. It's a paper advertisement. And this uh, is a cover for an interior uh, design magazine. He also did a lot of work, worked as a uh, consultant for the important uh, the most important Swiss pharmaceutical company, Gaii, which had offices based in New York, outside of New York City. Um, his depression, right? Depression, medication, designs are reduced to simplified images and forms. The one on the left, well, both of them, maybe they're even collage cutouts, but the one on the left is showing you the rapid relief of depression that you will get when you take the medication. And the one on the right is showing you the patient's struggle with depression. So he's simplifying the ideas down to their essence with one or two powerful images. This maybe was his uh, most powerful strength. He and others turned the, uh, the pharmaceutical, the, the traditional pharmaceutical industry into uh, an industry that, um, that was heavily uh, uh, using experimentation. Okay. 
There are many designers who did not live in the United States, but published work in the United States. And I'm including them because they were publishing work in important publications or for important clients, and the work was being seen by many, both customers, clients, and also by the industry. This one in 1948 is by Albe Steiner. Actually designed it while he was living in Mexico, but he's Italian. And um, the cover illustrates uh, Alvo, Alvar Alto's uh, famous bent plywood chair. Roberto Carboni also uh, worked in Milan and was one of the earliest modern designers to do fortune cover magazines, probably from his colleague, Leo Leone, who was the art director at the time. Here's one that we may know. Giovanni Pintori worked for Olivetti since the mid-1930s. He used graphic metaphors and symbols to clearly and expressively communicate technology. He also had an important exhibit at MoMA in 1952 called Olivetti Design in Industry. And the exhibit basically tried to uh, teach and educate American companies that uh, we should follow the standards of Olivetti, the high standards of taste, good products, good functional product design. I'm going to just move along quickly and talk about Bruno Minari. Uh, we all know Bruno Minari. His influence is widespread. Art, writing, publishing, teaching, children's book illustrations. Uh, he was a pioneer for crossing boundaries and uh, crossing the boundaries of art and design. And this is a cover for Interiors Magazine, the first that we see in America where it's not entirely clear what it is. There's a painting of Minari, and it's superimposed by a three-dimensional object, a screen. And the editors say that it represents the hot, blazing colors of August. So, yeah. also had an exhibit in uh, New York's Museum of Modern Art, 1955. And the curator said, Munari's inventiveness has enlarged the vocabulary of graphic design through the use of three dimensions. And here's a little known design by Max Huber, who was actually Swiss, but spent uh, most of his career in Italy, working in Milan for many important clients in the famous uh, Bougeri studio. Max Huber is the most important link between what was happening in Italy and what was happening in the US. He traveled to the US two times in 1957 or 58, and he made contacts with many American designers as well as international designers. He spoke at a few conferences in New, York's, in New York State and Connecticut. He is the one who organized the very first uh, exhibition called 10 Designers from Milan. This was an exhibition organized by Max Huber in New York City at a small gallery called Gallery 303 in 1960. This is the first time in the United States where all of these Italian designers were shown collectively in one exhibit. And this is the uh, responsibility of Max Huber. Although, I've read the letters in the archive, and he had a great deal of difficulty and frustration organizing this exhibit from Milan. And I quote, I felt ashamed that my Milanese colleagues did not respond, urging them to keep their word and prepare the material. I keep calling them by telephone in a most monotonous way. Yes, 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 you'll get it tomorrow, and weeks passed by. Unfortunately, I will never again take the responsibility for their promises. So sad. <laughs> but the exhibit happened. It never happened uh, again. This was the only 
as far as I know, exhibit with these designers shown collectively in the United States. At last, I have come to the conclusion, I am sure you will agree, that the next collective exhibition will be a Max Huber personal one. That never happened. But this did, and it's uh, part of our historical record in the United States, and it's an important historical record for Italians. Franco Grignani, who we, may, who we know, <laughs> the exhibit is, uh, is here. I hope everybody's seen it. He didn't publish much in New York City, but he uh, kept contact with many designers in New York City. And he spoke at important lectures in the United States. But by the 1960s, his optical work was widespread, and he had more than eight individual or collective exhibitions in the United States. And moving right along to the end is um, a name that we all know, Massimo Vignelli, who left Italy in late 1965 for the US, and with Bob Norda and six other designers and thinkers founded Unimark International, a new breed of company focusing on corporate identity in America, influenced by an aesthetic and visual language of coordinated and systematic corporate design. Here's a photo of the studio and the famous Knoll poster that Massimo Vignelli designed using Helvetica, presumably inspired by his friend, colleague, and roommate, Max Huber, if we know Huber's work and we see Vignelli's work, there's definitely an influence. And he was the art director, uh, I'm sorry, the design director for industrial design in 1967. And a master at using color as an identifier, as in these corporate projects, one for American Airlines on the left and one for Knoll International on the right, one color. And another Unimark uh, partner, I'm um, sorry, designer who was invited to the US by Vignelli. Actually, Vignelli was his teacher, I believe, in Venice. Uh, Giulio Cittato, who worked for uh, the Chicago office of Unimark and probably Unimark's most important uh, corporate identity project, the first project that they use where they establish their most respected typeface, Helvetica as the most popular and best, most legible typeface to use. And work by Cittato and Bob Norda, who I'm not mentioning today, but if you were at Sasha's talk last night, he talked in great detail about the graphic standards manual that Bob Norda did with Massimo Vignelli, probably his most important contribution to the United States. But this uh, little unknown work for the Aspen Design Conference was a collaboration between Chicago and Milan. So it's working, it's working the other way also. And our very last uh, designer, Heinz Weibel, came to uh, Chicago in 1967 and also worked for Massimo Vignelli's Unimark International, where he was most re mostly responsible for uh, American corporate trademarks and logo work and department work such as Levy's and maybe the most well-known J.C. Penney. He used Helvetica. He designed this with Massimo Vignelli direction and it became the kind of no frills department store that middle America in the United States Started to, started to see the ubiquitous modern design of the very late 1960s or early 70s. Okay, so that's it. There's so much. <laughs> uh, let me just sum it up by saying, I hope that you see that all of this work is from my point of view. It's from an American's point of view. So it's seeing the work in probably different contexts than you might see it. But I think that it's important because the work 
was traveling. The ideas were traveling. They were moving between countries and beyond. And it's this work that kind of sets in motion what the work in, uh, in New York or Chicago or Los Angeles was, was uh, being uh, followed by, if that makes sense. It didn't all look like this. Much of it looks different. The years are different. The styles change. But the general spirit is there. And I think it's because these Italian designers, and there are probably about 40 more. Don't have the time today, but maybe that's another book one day. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's about all these relationships. So uh, I hope you learned something today. Yeah, I did. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot, because of course you did a lot of uh, mentions in your presentation, a lot of Italians. It's strange uh, listening uh, your point of view from American. Uh, just a quick question, quick curiosity. Which is your favorite? I mean, it's not a favorite one. Uh, which is the most closest to your work uh, yeah. or the one you take more inspiration from? Yeah, I uh, like probably many people in this room, I, uh, I do gravitate towards um, the sensibility and the ideology of the work that Massimo Vignelli was doing in the United States, but also in Italy, and the work of Unimark, his organization. I think it's work that, uh, that um, although it was done in the 1960s, it still feels fresh and smart and logical today. So I think these are, uh, these are important things with design. What could stand the test of time? Some of it looks dated, the earliest stuff from the 30s or 40s. But uh, yeah, the work of Massimo okay. and Unimark is. Patricia, you agree? Or you have a different? <laughs> <Okay>. Good. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Thank you very much, guys.